Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Max. Good morning, Peixoto, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks for being here with us today in the British Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I am Fabio Caldas, the president of Britain in Rio de Janeiro. I am also the founding partner of Lightsaber Consultancy. Uh, I, I would like to highlight the British, the Britain's mission statement, which is uh, to be the reference of the UK Brazil slash Brazil business community providing a forum to foster bilateral trade, investment, service, and relationships. Uh, so if you have your business, you want to do something on trade and investment uh, that involves Brazil and UK bilateral trade, please come to us, uh, talk to us. We have offices in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Paraná, and Minas Gerais. Our membership, you know, it's an, you, I'm quite sure you're going to have quite a strong network in Britain with very high decision-making executives in the Brazil and the UK. I would say short-term networking, networking, yes, but I would say my main benefit was medium to long-term networking. You know, I have friends, I have uh, colleagues that I've been in touch with for a long time, very good for the business, very good for, my, for myself personally. And we have a number, you know, several fronts and opportunities. Uh, you saw the opening slide uh, of this webinar, both the, the, the subjects and the names of the leaders who have them, you know, and to learn more about this fronts and opportunities that we have a number of them, please just visit the, the Chamber's website, which is www.britchon.com.br. You know, there's a wide range of, of, of activities to add value to your business. We work very closely with the British government and have a she achieved significant growth uh, with several companies uh, from several sectors joining Britain, which confirms, you know, we are growing a lot, which confirms, you know, this value added that I refer to, the value added to their business. So, uh, we have added new activities. I wanted to highlight that. Uh, uh, and we think that's going to add a lot of value to our members. You saw how many times I've been saying about value added. We, we, are, we are putting in place an advocacy, uh, an advocacy committee to support engagement with key uh, stakeholders. And now I'm going for my thanks. Well, again, to all of you for attending this webinar. Uh, to bridge on supporting members, uh, you saw in the opening of the webinar. To Mr. Carlos Peixoto, my friend Peixoto, we work very closely. He's the president of Britain's Oil and Gas Committee. And we also moderate this, uh, this webinar. Hello, my friend. And also, of course, to Massimiliano Serra, we call him Max, for accepting our invitation to bring this very relevant content to our audience. You know, we made a crossfire with him and it was quite a success, real stupendous. So you're gonna have now all this amount of knowledge here with you. I would also like to apologize. It's a bit somber, a bit dark here. It's because Murphy's Law stroke here with my lamp here on the top. So apologies for- Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Fabio, for your words and this introduction. Good morning, Max. Uh, thank you to the audience and uh, also good afternoon for those that are in the UK uh, and, and everywhere else. Uh, uh, my name is Carlos Peixoto. I'm currently heading the, the Oil and Gas Committee at the Britchan. And I'm a member of Fabio's uh, committee, the Power and Renewables Committee. Uh, thank you, Max, for joining us today. Thank you to the Britain for organizing this uh, webinar for the oil and gas and the PRC committees. Thanks also to Fabricio Soares, the manager of the Britain in Sao Paulo, who is in the background providing all the support 
for our webinar this morning. Uh, also, thank, thanks to, the, uh, to our sponsors and thank you for everybody for joining us today. Let me make a brief uh, uh, introduction of, of Max, but before of that, let me tell you that we have this Q&A button uh, uh, below in your screen. The idea is that Max is going to make a presentation of uh, 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. And we will have a, a 20 minutes uh, session of uh, Q&A. And I encourage you to place your questions in the Q&A and I will be moderating these uh, questions and uh, uh, sharing them with, with Max. Uh, Max is, uh, has graduated in chemistry from the National University of Technology in Buenos Aires. He's a lecturer in, a, in, in, in hydrogen matters and a financial modeling and valuation analyst. He's a member of the Corporate Finance Society. And uh, he's currently doing a master science in technology at the Victoria University, Wellington in New Zealand. And uh, all of this on top of being a member of the expert panel at the World Energy Council. And uh, more than that, he's a friend of the British a friend of us. And uh, welcome you, Max. Please uh, take the floor and make your presentation. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible in order to reach the deadline. Uh, something that I would like to clarify from my presentation is that uh, I'm a graduate from, I'm a bachelor in chemistry from the universe, from Victoria University in, in Wellington. Just to, to clarify that, I'm now lecturing, yes, in the National University of Technology in Argentina. Uh, so I, what I brought to you today is uh, a presentation uh, to, to talk a, a little bit about the hydrogen market, what are the opportunities and the developments that we can expect for for this next five to 10 years. Uh, in order to do that, we need to first understand what's going on in the stock market. Uh, I come from a financial analysis background. So I worked in finance for the past eight years. So whenever I want to see what's going on, the first thing that I do is take a look at what's going on with the stock market and the investment trends. Now, as we can see, the here we have an example of three companies. One of them is a huge oil and gas company. Another one is one of the largest renewable energy companies. And the last is one company that it's leading the hydrogen fuel cell markets. So when we take a look at this, uh, we don't need to be financial analysts, nor economists, nor engineers to understand a little bit of what's going on. If we take a look at this, the oil and gas industry, whoever is investing on this can see that it's declining. Uh, we can see a, a bit of a stagnation in the renewables. However, the alternative energy and the technological sectors are the ones that are doing the best at the moment uh, with exponential uh, growth. And last but not least, we need to think about what's going on with the COVID situation. Because when people talk about, yes, the COVID crash, yes, last year we saw a massive and dramatic crash of the stock markets due to the COVID situation, which happened around the 19th of February. However, all of the sectors collapsed once did uh, once suffered around 50% drops, others around 70, but the key issue is what happened post COVID or what's going on during COVID? Well, the oil and gas industry is struggling. The renewable energy companies managed to actually recover and make around three or 3.3% profits. 
However, when we take a look at the alternative energy companies, such as the ones involved in hydrogen, we do not only see a three-month recovery, but we also see lots of profits. We see we can actually see that the increase was of 300% on the stock market. So this talks about a shift of investments when it comes to the stock markets. And this actually spots several trends when it comes to investments and um, private equity banking. So let's take a look at what's, what, when it comes to hydrogen, what's the state of the art? Well, today, the global hydrogen production is around between, it, it actually fluctuates between 70 million to 90 million tons a year. For instance, last year, we had 70 million tons produced around ish, and this was due to the COVID situation. The year before, it was of 92 million tons, and the day before, and the year before, it was around 82. So we can actually talk about that range. When it comes to a global hydrogen production, uh, it doesn't struck me to see that around 90% of the global production, 96, comes from the oil and gas uh, production. So it's from 53% from natural gas, and then we have some market share from oil and coal. However, 4% comes from electrolysis. When we want to produce hydrogen from electrolysis, it's basically passing a current of electrons through water and splitting the molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. Now, this 4%, this 4 accounts from electrolysis made from the grid. So the grid is not decarbonized. Only 0.1% of the global hydrogen production comes from green power electrolysis. And this is where what we're going to try to figure out today. Should we invest in green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, or should we not invest in hydrogen at all? So today's market cap, when it comes to hydrogen, we're talking about $140 billion industry a year. Uh, this was actually calculated by the World Energy Council. We can stipulate a steady 9.2% growth up to 2025. So we can expect if this happens to turn this $140 billion industry into $200 billion a year, which is quite a lot, maybe not as much as the oil and gas industry, but it's quite a lot when it comes to talking about renewable energy. Now, another issue that uh, we encounter when giving webinars and lectures is What's going to happen with the oil, with the water issue? Because we need a lot of water to produce hydrogen from electrolysis. And yes, that's true. We need around 600 million cubic meters of water a year in order to decarbonize all of this hydrogen production. However, it sounds like a lot, but it's only 2% of the amount of water that the whole energy sector consumes in a year. So it's not that much when it comes to running you know, the math and the balance. However, it is a lot when it comes to talking about renewable energy. In order to produce all of the hydrogen from green energy today, we're gonna need around 3,600 terawatt hours a year, which accounts for half of the EU's renewable energy capacity installed today. So this number actually worries me a lot, more than this one. So if, let's say that this is the first key point, if we want to produce green hydrogen, we're gonna need to at least double or triple our amount of uh, renewable energy installed capacity. Turning on the economics, where are we today? Well, today, financiers such as such as me, such as uh, Ed Bodmer, people who are working with Project Finance, uh, we're trying to figure out the risk allocation and the project finance needed in order for hydrogen to work. 
Now, today, 2021, we can say that we are in the early growth stage of the uh, hydrogen projects and technology. What does this mean? We can expect an increase and a hype on the sales. We can expect some projects to be profitable, but there's an offset between our cash flow and our profits, which lowers our IRR of the project. And this needs to be taken care of. So how are we going to figure this out? First of all, we need to consider about the demand. So today's hydrogen demand is basically for ammonia production, you know, NH3, for fertilizers and refining process. This is basically turning, you know, uh, turning petrol into lighter petrol, if that makes sense. And this chart is a chart that I use a lot for lectures. And why is that? This is easily, easily uh, analyzed through a linear. If we trace a curve, this actually is a straight line. So we can actually make great forecasts with this. If we run the math, we can see that the hydrogen demand is has been increasing by 7% yearly since 1975 up to date. And this is a steady growth, mostly due to the ammonia industry. The ammonia industry is growing exponentially according to the uh, worldwide population. So what I'm trying to focus on today is for you to learn a bit more of this sector right here, what we call other. This other sector brings other applications. So who uses hydrogen and what for? Well, <clears throat> today, when we talk about the pillars of hydrogen, we, we can spot three types of sectors, fuels, heat, and feedstock. Now, when, we, when it comes to fuels, well, we know that we're talking about fuel cell electric vehicles and fuel cell electric trucks. Uh, these sectors right here, ships, uh, aircrafts, I don't see it coming in the short term. However, trains, this does make sense. I don't know if you guys heard, but Alstom actually developed a hydrogen train as around a thousand kilometers of autonomy and they run the numbers. And if we, if this were to be electric, it would have 200 kilometers of autonomy. So that's a large difference with the same amount of uh, equivalents. Now, on the other hand, we have the power sector, you know, peaker plants, electricity, and another sector that it's very attractive for hydrogen, it's using it as for heat. So what does this mean? It's basically burning hydrogen. So if we burn hydrogen today, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just drop it. If we burn hydrogen today, whenever you burn it, you're gonna have water, okay? So this is actually what I'm trying to, to get. Today, if we burn oil and gas, when Whenever we burn, we have CO2 and we have water as well. And this is not good. However, if we burn hydrogen, we're going to have water. And this is what the whole process of decarbonization means. We can burn fuels without emitting carbon dioxide. And that's what we're actually working for. Now, another sector that is gaining lots of attractiveness, at least to me as a chemist, is using it as feedstock for green products, metals, steel, food industry, fertilizers, plastics. So this is what I call a captive sector. They use hydrogen today. These demands need to be established and need to be created. This already exists. So it's, we have an immediate offtaker over here. So if I would have to choose today, which are our main focus for hydrogen, 
I would tell you that it's the hard to decarbonize sectors, heat, feedstock for chemicals and green products. And this can be done with low investments and green hydrogen produced on site as we're gonna see in this picture right here. So what's the hydrogen economy all about? Well, the concept of hydrogen economy is pretty simple. We have oil and gas, okay? Uh, through a process, you can produce hydrogen. The only thing that we're trying to promote is if you wanna do it this way, please include CCS. This is carbon capture and storage. So we reduce the CO2 emissions. And this is what we need to do today, reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. So this is one way. And another way of, of is from electricity generation. So how is it today? Today's grid, we have renewables, wind, solar, hydro, whatever you want to call it. And on the other hand, we have still oil and gas. So what we need to do to produce our hydrogen is either blue hydrogen from this and CCS, or take it over here. And we can produce it from renewable energy. And once you produce it, you get your hydrogen. Now, what do we do with our hydrogen? Well, we can blend it in the natural gas network. So this means that we're gonna have lower carbon dioxide emissions in the end users. We can use it for heat. We can use it for power, industrial applications. Now, why do we separate ammonia? from hydrogen. Well, this is another, and, and we're gonna leave that for another lecture because this is gonna take a lot of, but basically we can turn hydrogen into ammonia, use it for many other sectors, and also we can use it to ship hydrogen. So ammonia is a vector to transport hydrogen basically. And we can do this cheaply. It's actually cheaper to ship a cargo full of ammonia instead of a cargo full of hydrogen. Uh, so what can we expect? How can we finance this? Well, this is what I'm working on right now. If we were to look and study, we'll see that there are points in hydrogen. Either we have bankable projects, or emerging industries, which aren't, aren't bankable today. So what's bankable? Today, if we were to talk with Merrill Lynch, B. Morgan, or I don't know, the largest private equity firms, we need, we're, we're gonna be asked to present an offtake arrangement. This is what we need. We need someone that is going to buy our, our, our hydrogen for the next, 35 years, similar to oil and gas. On the other hand, they are going to finance existing uses with an existing market. So for instance, who is, I'm gonna decarbonize the pharmaceutical industry. So is buying hydrogen from a supplier, I'm gonna produce it on site, that's bankable. What's bankable? Well, the ammonia industry, oil and gas industry, and fuel cell applications, such as forklifts or heavy duty trucks. Now, who are the sectors that are struggling to get finance? Well, the emerging markets, such as mining. We are trying to promote using hydrogen for industrial mobility. Energy storage, you know, if we were to use more renewables in the electricity generation, we're gonna need energy storage for baseload. And in that case, lithium ion is not as good as hydrogen. I'm not comparing batteries to hydrogen. I'm actually doing it by saying this, but you cannot use a battery for long-term storage. You can use hydrogen for long-term storage. On the other hand, the cement industry 
can be harvested from on-site production. Steel industry as well, industrial heat, high-grade heat. When we talk about ovens for Coke, for instance, and we want to achieve 3,000 Celsius, 7,000 Celsius, we cannot achieve that with a battery and a resistance but we can actually achieve that burning hydrogen. And another emerging use is the blending of hydrogen in the gas grid. It's basically like it happened in South America with the biofuels. Well, we say, well, we need a cut of the petrol with biofuels. Well, it's, gonna, it's going to be the same with the natural gas grid. Now, there's a problem with the emerging, with the emerging markets. Because there are existing mining projects, energy storage, steel industry projects, and industrial heat projects with hydrogen. Now, what's the issue? In order for this to be bankable, we're going to need large balance sheets and credit ranking. So we're looking more of a corporate finance kind of deal instead of a project finance. So what does this mean? They're not gonna finance and give you a loan if you don't have a great credit ranking. If you take a look at these industries, the companies that are involved in this sector are huge oil and gas firms. So those are the ones that can ask for a loan, a type A or type B. On the other hand, what do we need finance and make hydrogen viable. We need a multi-project opportunity. What does this mean? We already saw everything that we can do with hydrogen. So this actually means that we have multiple opportunities to supply green hydrogen or blue. So this leads into diversification of investment. Through diversification of investment, we can achieve a diversification and dilution of our risks. So if we achieve that, our project is now from emerging into bankable project. And that's what we need to do. We need to find industrial clusters where we can find a project that is not producing hydrogen for one straight use, but for multiple projects. And that's actually bankable. So if now that we know that our hydrogen is bankable or not, we need to think about green hydrogen. So what do we need for our green project to work? Well, I actually developed this chart for you guys to take a look at. If we want to produce green hydrogen, we're using electricity, green electricity, and water. So when we take a look at this, this is a chart that compares our cost of hydrogen per kilogram as a function of the load factor. And also, we have different scenarios, you know, $20 per megawatt up to $50 per megawatt hour. This is what we call PPA in the industry. So when we take a look at this, in order for green hydrogen to work, we're going to need two factors, basically. We need a high load factor, around 60 plus. And why is this? Why do we need this? Well, we actually need that 60% plus because once you are above 60% load factor, you can take a look at that. Most of the curves tend to stagnate. So that's when it comes doing the right balance and see if you're going to operate at 90%, 80%, or 70%. And that's where your project finance modeler comes in and tells you your right amount of load factor is actually this in order to break even and make money. From here on, it's basically the same, and here you're losing money. So once we know that, another driver is our PPA. 
basically, the cheaper we get the electricity, if the electricity is our feedstock. So who are the sectors that are going to benefit the most? Well, countries such as Brazil, such as Argentina, such as Chile, who have low costs of electricity. Let's say that in Europe, talking about $30, $20 a PPA, it's very expensive. It's, it's, it's actually a dream come true. But here, it's actually day-to-day -day business. We can negotiate a PPA at $30 a megawatt. And that's easy. What we need to focus on is what are we going to do with the load factor? Because this is solar. This is wind and this is hydro so what energy source am i going to use because i can have the cheaper in the world such as in the uae at 13 dollars a megawatt hour that with a 20 percent load factor i'm still going to be high for the market so what we need is either a high load factor or build a hybrid scheme. That's why we've been using the grid for so long, because the grid allows us to achieve a high load factor. So if we want to decarbonize hydrogen, we need to think of hybrid schemes, you know, maybe a solar farm with a wind farm, a wind farm with a hydro dam, or a wind with solar, but you get the point. We need to build hybrid high load factor schemes. So what does this bring me to? These are the cost parities that we need to achieve. People are talking about the $2 per gram target. So whenever we need to think about this, what does $2 of hydrogen mean? Well, I'm gonna show you right now. If we want to compare our hydrogen production today, we need to compare it with diesel, natural gas, coal, ship fuel, and kerosene. So if we want our hydrogen to work in buses, we can make it work at $4. That's actually achievable. If we want hydrogen to work in trains, we need to be around 3.8. We need to be in trucks around 2.2 in order to compete versus diesel. Now, what I want to tell you is we are already here in hydrogen. So buses is actually competitive. If you travel to Aberdeen, for instance, they already have a large fleet of hydrogen buses. Now, which are the sectors that are going to struggle the most? Well, that's what I remember when I told you airplanes. Well, if we want to produce hydrogen for airplanes, we need to be around dot six or dot five in order to be competitive versus kerosene. This is going to be very, very hard. This is something that we're going to struggle a lot. So today, when we talk about green hydrogen, we are around 250 to $5. And if we talk about blue from natural gas, we're talking about 1.7 to $2.2. So what can we do today with our hydrogen cost? Decarbonize buses, trains, trucks, SUVs, and that's it. So those are the sectors that we need to aim for today, mobility where we are actually competitive. These are going to happen, but in the longer term, let's say five to 10 years from now, in 2030. So this is what I want you to remember. Hydrogen today is competitive in some cases, in some cases it's not. So we need to run our models accordingly in order to determine what we're going to do. Now, who are the key players that are spotted by 
the World Energy Council, DMV, BP, the largest consulting firms. Well, the key players, we like to think about, let's say, four kinds of players. We have the ones that are going to produce it and consume it on site. Countries such as New Zealand, Norway. And why is that? Well, they've got great potential for production, but let's say that those are very small countries. They cannot produce large amounts in order to be exporters. So they're going to mostly produce it and consume it on site in the country. Who are the countries that are going to import hydrogen? Well, if we talk about importing, we need to talk about Japan, Germany, France, Italy, UK. And why is that? It's basically because those are the countries that we are projecting and forecasting that they are going to have a larger demand and not able, and hence not be able to produce the amount of hydrogen that they're going to need because of lack of resources. And this is where these kinds of countries begin to make sense. Who are going to be self-sufficient and who are going to be exporters? And we need to think about countries who can actually produce cheap hydrogen and export it. I think that the gap is going to be exactly here. Australia, basically because of their way of addressing the hydrogen economy. The government just said, produce hydrogen. I don't care if it's green, blue, coal, I don't know, whatever. Build me a demand, make it economically viable. And then we're gonna see what happens. So Australia now is leading this market with Canada. Canada is a country with a great potential. They've got Alberta and Quebec. So they've got everything figured out. They've got the capital of renewables and the capital of the oil and gas industry. So they can produce any kind of hydrogen they want and they can do it cheaply. Another country that I want to focus on is Brazil. And why I talk about Brazil and not Chile or Argentina? Well, and this is me thinking. I think that Argentina, it's actually and Chile, those are two countries that politically are not stable enough, such as Brazil. Brazil is a country that can actually produce great hydrogen and do it cheaply and export it without changing the, let's say, the rules and the frameworks. Now, this is the offtake scheme that I suggest. I guess that if we want to produce hydrogen centrally, we need to do it with, this is actually large scale, large scale green hydrogen or blue. And if we want to do a local production, decentralized, we need to think about green and not steam reformers because you cannot build small reactors. So this actually makes, makes it economically viable. So towards the end of my, uh, of my lecture, what I want you to see is these are the applications where I see that a decentralized hydrogen production can work. And what's the advantage of on-site production? If we produce hydrogen on-site with renewables, we don't have inventory because we don't need to stock our hydrogen. We don't have a supplier, so we're not paying a premium. We don't have compliance issues. We don't... We we can have an unmanned hydrogen production. So we don't need that take and pay or take or pay contract. We don't need a storage. And you must know that the distribution cost accounts for around two thirds of the final cost of hydrogen. So we're gonna have around 50 to 70% of savings in our final hydrogen. So what do we need for hydrogen to work? And this is my last slide. We have two approaches, the business and the markets. Let's approach the business first. So the business, what we need today for a project to work is a long-term fixed contract 
we need someone who's willing to buy our hydrogen for the next 20 to 25 years. We need an offtake contract that it can either be take and pay or take or pay. We need our distribution scheme. We need to think, are we going to produce it on site or am I going to produce it centrally and distribute it, distribute it to our consumers? And this brings us a duality. And why do I talk about a duality? Because if we do it centrally, we're going to have a higher capex and a lower opex. But if we do it on site, it's going to turn the other way around. We're going to have a lower capex, but a higher opex. So we need to, 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 to study the trade-off that we're going to have over there. We need to guarantee ourselves EPC warranties. The EPC in a project is 50% of our project, basically. So we need to have EPC warranties. On strategy, we need to reduce, today, our, around 90% of the hydrogen projects are 100% equity finance. So what we need to do is reduce our equity in order, in order to improve our levered IRR. So if we want to have higher returns, we need to increase our percent of debt. And the only way that we're going to do that is with a long-term contract, an offtake contract, and with a debt sculpting according to our cash flow. That's something very, very difficult to model, but it's actually, well, I mean, we can do that. We actually do that, <laughs> but uh, it's, it, it's not as simple to model a hydrogen plant than to model a renewable plant. So when you model a renewable energy plant, you know that you have one panel that produces one megawatt, two panels produces two megawatts, and that's it. When you have hydrogen, it's basically like an LNG plant. You need to think about liquefaction, compression, storage. You need to think about uh, natural gas. You need to think about your electricity, your water. You have too many variables. And last, we're going to turn into the market. So what does the market need today? Well, hydrogen actually needs government support. We need and this is something that we actually need. We need either subsidies. If it's not subsidies, we're going to need a carbon tax for the people who are burning carbon. Or at least we're going to need some sort of aid from the governments because we need this to work. It's like, it's not our bullet. It's one of the other bullets that it's going on at the moment. We need industry-specific industry financial models, as I told you earlier. We need people who are specialized in hydrogen. What happened in the hydrogen industry is most of the people who got into hydrogen came from the renewable energy sector. And we need people from the gas industry to get into hydrogen in order for this to work. Because hydrogen is a gas, and we need to treat it as such. On the other hand, we need a market development with focus on the immediate off-takers. We're st I'm still listening to people talk about, well, we could actually build a cluster over here and maybe sell hydrogen to someone. And that's very hard to do, you know, because when you talk to a CEO, what he's going to tell you is, is this more expensive than diesel? I'm not interested. So what we need is, how can we decarbonize the existing demand? And that's an immediate off-taker, because if you can decarbonize that, he's going to need his hydrogen. The others don't need it at the moment. And this brings me to low-carbon financing, green marketing. The technology is going to need scale-up. So today, our largest electrolyzer is around 20 megawatts, and we need to think about uh, larger projects in order to bring scale. And we're going to achieve this only with 
key partnerships and alliances. And this needs to be done with the major players, as I spoke earlier, in order to have, uh, let's say, a better credit ranking, a better balance sheet, and also to have financeable projects. So, so basically, I want to thank you all for your time. I'm open for Q&A, but uh, I wanted to thank you a lot for this this opportunity, and uh, I hope that you liked uh, what I had to do, what I had to say. Max, thank you very much. And then, uh, you are an Argentinian, a British Argentinian, because we agreed that 10.45, you would time your presentation, you were just charged. <laughs> thank you very much, my friend. I know, I know that this is very difficult to cover everything you covered. And with the, with the in-depth analysis that you have made uh, in, this, in this short time. And, uh, but uh, with the experience you have, even though you're a very young person, but with the experience you have in this, uh, not only in the matter, but also as a lecturer, you have achieved that uh, pretty, pretty well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me, let me go through some of the questions we have. Uh, uh, let me give the priority to Richard Taylor, who is a member of one of two of our committees here. Richard uh, uh, is the owner of Tech Ventures. He says, great presentation and interesting charts, especially the hydrogen production costs. My question is, what is, the, what is happening with the market pricing of green hydrogen? And is there any price differential emerging with blue hydrogen? Well, uh, that's a great question. And it's actually related to the one from uh, Marcelo Hayes. So I'm going to answer both of them, if, if I may. Uh, of course. So the thing is, when it comes to either blue or green hydrogen, what you need to know is what's most expensive of hydrogen is the distribution process. So today there isn't a price differential. So if you produce blue hydrogen, you're selling it at the same price as if it was green and at the same price as if it was gray with our carbon capture. So today hydrogen, yes, it is expensive to buy from a supplier, but this is because there isn't a price differential. It hasn't emerged yet. Uh, there is a company named Certify that they are, are they, that's what they want to do. What I told them, and this is just me thinking, if you're going to charge your car at a petrol station and they tell you this petrol is, let's say, eco-friendly, so you need to pay $3 a liter, a, the liter versus $1 the liter, most of us would choose the $1. So that's what we need to do today. I think that the price differential emerging from blue hydrogen and uh, other sources needs to drop by distribution costs. And also, I think that we're, it will be levered if we implemented a carbon tax. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's a, that's a way of, of addressing this. And uh, turning on to what Marcelo actually said about a potential market for small and medium companies to sell hydrogen. Uh, I actually see that happening uh, because if we're going to talk about, let's say, uh, decarbonizing these sectors, such as, I don't know, pharmaceutical industry, food industry, that they are currently buying hydrogen and using it. Well, you have an issue because a company like BP, Shell, they are not going to get into the market for a 500 kilowatt or a one megawatt uh, project. So those projects are ideal for small startups. Today, most of the hydrogen projects come from startups. 
And what we're trying to do is if we want to achieve the scale that is needed for the cost to drop, we need to have larger projects. And uh, I, I add, this is one way of addressing the market. Thank you. Uh, uh, address Andre Andre Kick's uh, question. What about conversion of uh, methanol? Well, yes, uh, methanol is a great. What I, what I think about methanol is it's a great means to an end, because we're talking about net zero. So that means no carbon dioxide emissions. So methanol has carbon emissions. So what I think is it's great to use methanol as a means to an end, if it makes sense. For instance, using methanol in ships, using methanols in aircrafts, where we don't need to make any infrastructure adjustment. However, there's going to be a point where uh, if we keep on burning methanol, we're going to have carbon dioxide emissions. So today is is a possibility, is a possibility. But if we want to reach net zero, we're gonna need molecules that don't have carbon in their structure. And that's where hydrogen comes in, ammonia comes in, and several others. Um, now- From uh, L.A. K. Reyes, uh, she's asking, I would like to ask about the hydrogen use as feedstock for chemical products. Uh, uh, what, what are the trends and main uses? Well, that's the market that I'm trying to approach. Actually, my thesis is, is about that. So that's a great question. Um, well, the chemical industry uses a lot of hydrogen. For instance, uh, whenever you buy oil, of the supermarket, that oil, it's actually hydrogenated. So if you read what it says, it's hydrogenated oil. The same happens with chocolates, not the best kind of chocolates, but the chocolates that you buy, I don't know, in Brazil, the pasoquitas, those use hydrogen for hydrogenation process. Because if you hydrogenate that molecule, what you do, this lasts more. So you extend the shelf life. So I think that those industries are industries that are not being mentioned right now because of their consumption, because you can actually, I think that they use around 6,000 6, cubic meters a month. But however, let's say that you go to those companies and instead of telling them you're buying hydrogen at $22 a kilogram or $15 a, ki a kilogram, you can actually use the hydrogen, produce it on site and produce it at four bucks, seven bucks. That's actually cheaper, more renewable. So I think that this is actually a great use. Another use, it's the ammonia for fertilizers. Uh, most of the fertilizers industry produce their ammonia under hydrogen on site. So what you could do is sell them a solution that's gonna be cheaper. So what I was thinking is, I see great potential for these industries in Brazil. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity. People are talking a, a lot about the state of Ceará, the port of Azul. So I think that there are many things going on in Brazil. Brazil is a very attractive player. So what do I, what I do, and I'm certain that uh, we can achieve a hydrogen market of, let's say, uh, where, where Brazil can actually export hydrogen to the EU. I think that that's something that can happen. And I'm going to tell you why. Brazil has cheap resources, has a lot of solar, has wind, has great PPAs, and also has most of the infrastructure needed. So I think that, yes, Brazil can be a key player. And uh, the only we, thing, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, conclude, please. The only thing that I was reading is, uh, well, there's a question about 
uh, a higher consciousness and if the society if, is going to accept paying a higher cost of energy. Well, that's the thing. I think that, uh, I think that enough question because post COVID, we're going to have an increase in poverty. We're going to have people who lost their jobs, lots of health issues. So I think that no, for people, energy will not be a priority for the end consumer. However, when you talk to governments, this the energy is a priority to governments. So what I'm thinking is there is a lot of room for hydrogen in this transition. And I think that we can produce it cheaply and people will not be willing to pay that higher cost but we can reach parity with hydrocarbons. And that can be done from countries with cheap PPAs or such as Brazil as well that have carbon capture already installed. So you can produce hydrogen either for from natural gas, which is going to be very cheap and capture all of the CO2 emissions or produce it from cheap PPAs and electricity. So that's my vision. No, people will not pay a higher cost for energy because today we see that with organics. For instance, if you buy, an or let's say that Devasa now produces organic beer. If you have to pay $10 the bottle of beer, people are not going to drink it. People are going to stay with the plain uh, Loira, Devasa Loira. So that's, that's actually what I drink. That's why I mentioned it. So... Yes, I think that people are not going to pay the premium. Yeah, that was one of the conclusions we had in one of the panels 15 days ago in the UK Brazil Energy uh, Partners in Energy. Uh, uh, one of the conclusions was that energy needs to be uh, uh, sustainable, available, but uh, affordable as well. And uh, you cannot, exactly. you cannot uh, have energy and uh, at, a, at a cost that is not affordable to, to people. And how, how, how are we going to deal with the, the economic and social uh, uh, disparities in the world? I mean, there are vast uh, areas of the world that still need uh, electrification. And how we will do that if energy is not affordable? Uh, thank you very much for your. There is one here that says uh, the last one, uh, if you if you don't mind. Recently, yes. we saw the announcement of two MOUs related to green uh, hydrogen projects in Brazil. One in Port of Passaic, in the state of Ceará, with focus in exports, and the other at Port of Assu, state of Rio de Janeiro, with focus. Uh, which the focus is to provide clean energy to projects at the port itself. Uh, in your view, how long uh, you think it will take for hydrogen to really take its place in the Brazilian energy market? Well, uh, well, tough question, uh, but I love to do forecast. So um, what I think is, 2030 is going to be a key year for hydrogen. And I'm going to tell you why, because uh, most of the projects that are being built today in the 2020s, 2021, even up to 2025 are going to be operating between 2025 and 2030. So I think that that's where the hydrogen hype is really going to happen. Today, we're trying to make, let's say the unviable viable. That's what's happening today. We to find the best PPA, the best cost, the best project finance. Once we figure that out, I think that it's just letting the market flow. And uh, we saw it from lots of, uh, lots of countries. They are setting their focus in countries such as Brazil, countries that have lots of resources to offer. And... Uh, I think that, yes, it's going to take around 10 years to begin, you know, this um, great hydrogen consumption. Max, thank you very much. Let me, let me thank you all for your participation. 
to the audience. Thank you very much to the Brit Chan for opening this space for us to discuss this uh, very relevant matter. And thanks to our sponsors that uh, are supporting the Brit Chan. Uh, Max, uh, a few words for us to, to, to close it this down. Okay, yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Carlos. You know that I love giving lectures for uh, the British and Brazilians as well. You know that I'm mostly Carioca myself. So, uh, and working for the World Energy Council, you know, I'm based basically in London. So it's kind of, uh, my heart is like split over there. Uh, so what I'm gonna tell you comes from the heart. I do believe in hydrogen. Uh, that's why I'm working on this. And I believe that uh, if we wanna make a change in the hydrogen uh, sector, what we're going to need is um, smart investing and key partnerships with between LATAM and the EU. I think that that's something that we're going to need to happen because the hydrogen consumption is going to be in the EU but the cheap hydrogen production, it's going to come from here. So I think that we need to build that bridge and that connection between South America and Europe. So that's, that's what I like to, to say. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, 11 o'clock and one minute. Uh, let's finish our, our discussion and thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much.